Time for a quick AI update. I've just spent the week at Arrival and ITB in Berlin. My head is full, completely full of AI conversations and other conversations in the travel industry. Um, I'm going to cover four things today. I'm going to talk about the latest ChatGPT API. Sorry for all the terminology right off the bat. It's the most recent API that came out about 10 days ago or something. I'm going to talk about GPT-4. I'm going to talk about the sunken costs fallacy. And I'm going to talk about uh, travel apps and applications in uh, transactions, air, hotel, and experiences. So first of all, um, the GPT, the ChatGPT API was just released last week for the first time. Previous APIs have been on previous versions of GPT. Um, the other thing that came out is is Whisper on API. Whisper is voice to text, which is excellent. It's it's, it's almost um, perfect. Um, these were important updates. Um, one of the things about the chat piece, though, it's it's sort of revealed how it's working in the background. So. Quick reminder on LLMs. LLM is large language model. That's what these things sit on. That's the basic knowledge they have. LLM read the internet and most books one word at a time. I've said this before. It doesn't know what it read. It doesn't have references to what it read. It just knows word associations and how to read sentences and important parts of sentences and things like that. But it, So on the one hand, it knows everything about everything that's ever been written. And on the other hand, it doesn't, doesn't know anything. It doesn't know that there's a Golden Gate Bridge. It just knows that Golden and Gate and Bridge tend to come together and it can rebuild, generate AI, uh, generate content. That's why it's called generative AI. Second part is it doesn't really have a very long memory. Its memory, in, in as far as a conversation, is 4,000 tokens, which is 3,000 approximately words. So when you, we've all done the chat back and forwards on the OpenAI website, and it chats, you could chat forever with the thing. But it only remembers 4,000 tokens in a back and forth conversation, a single back and forth. So what it's actually doing, it's just when I ask a question, it creates a response. If I then respond to that, it's, it's remembering the question I asked before and its response, and it's summarizing that with my next question. And then it responds again, it's going to summarize my th previous two questions and its response. So it's summarizing all the previous conversation we've had with every question that I ask. And the further we get away from that initial question, I assume it'll start m forgetting some of the stuff from 10 minutes ago so it can remind itself on the more recent conversations. So if you went to it and said, listen, what did we talk about 45 minutes ago? It's forgotten, unless that's been the theme all the way through. The reason this is important is we think that's going to be fairly stuck. I don't think this large memory is going to happen anytime soon. Not my expertise, but this is me listening to people who are the experts. And that's important because this is where the layers come in. This is where the layers for different verticals, for company applications, for industry applications. It needs a company to, need to, company to come in and remember these conversations and keep the themes and relate, you know, access bookings and access other information that can then be stored in databases. So when you come back to converse with this model again, it's remembered everything that just happened. OpenAI doesn't seem to make any moves into this space at all. They've said they don't want to. They want to enable these layers on top. That's why they create these APIs. That's going to be their, their monetization going forwards, we think. So that's important. They've, they're leaving space for all these companies to come and build layers on top. There's going to be thousands of them. Uh, there's going to be lots of chatbots. There's going to be lots of itinerary builders in the travel space. Too many. There's going to be some terrible ones, and hopefully there'll be some good ones as well. Two chat GP, uh, GP, GPT-4 is coming out next week. They just announced that in the next few days. Um, there was lots of speculation. Would it, be, would it be Q1 sometime this year? Anyway, it's coming out. Uh, we don't know what it is. We'll find out. Some speculation said it's going to be multimodal, so things like voice in, video out, video in, audio out, that kind of thing could be interesting. Uh, on the spot translation, video in, audio out, translated to German. Um, some people talk about it, it's going to have more recent data, which it may. Um, I actually don't think that's the most important thing. It's probably the most talked about thing, the fact that it doesn't remember know anything from pre-2021. Um, but I don't think that's the most important thing. The, the, these layers coming on top are going to have that recent data. It's never. I don't think it's going to be ever up to date 
of course, having said that, they'll release this next week and it'll be up to the second, but I, I don't think it will because they also have to moderate that data and it's been very good at moderation so far. And that takes time, it's expensive, and it just creates some problems. Um, in it, in it, but we always will. So we'll see what that looks like uh, when that comes out. Third thing I want to talk about, sunken cost fallacy. So this is a, um, a bias, a, a, a fallacy. So when you've when you've just spent, let's for example, you spent five years building this AI chatbot. Maybe you raised $20 million and you built a chatbot. Last five years, you an old technology and you finally released this in October. And now you're out at ITB talking about it. And then ChatGPT comes on the next day, which is actually better, potentially, than what you've already built. But you're now attached to what you've just spent five years building. That's difficult for a human to just walk away from all that time and money, even though there's a better solution. So companies are attached to old tech. There's a CTO who you know, built this. It's his, it's his or her baby, and they don't, want to, they don't want to move on. So these are things that happen. It's sunk cost, fall sunk cost fallacy. People don't move quickly enough because they want to make the most out of what they spent in the past. If um, if you do what's right for the company, you just throw that out on day one. You take the take the hit, and and move on and build the next build the ne next tool with the best technology. I'm in the same boat. I I I, I wrote a spec for a chat, uh, voice uh, application for Magpie this week, so we want to we want to query our, our product data with voice and spit out voice. Um, I wrote the spec this week. There's a very good chance that next week that'll be obs obsolete, and I could just use the APIs um, for, from GPT-4 for that. Who knows? So if that's the case, I'll throw it out, and we'll, we'll use the new API. I think companies need to get used to doing that thing they just built a few a few months ago, a few days ago, a few whatever. Throw it out, start again. <clears throat> Another example I came across this week was an um, audio company. They just spent a lot of money creating audio writing scripts, recording audio, translating that, recording in different languages, that stuff's expensive. Um, I'm not sure if we're exactly there yet, but audio is pretty close to human sounding. So if, it, if you get a tool that creates and it does sound like human, then it's time to throw all of that stuff out and just generate on the fly, translate on the fly, translate to 50 languages, not just six. Uh, doing that, you could also have up-to-date information. You could have an audio walking tour today. You could have the base content rewritten with all the storytelling that you want, everything you want, and then you could just insert the latest information and just regenerate the bits that you like. You could talk about events happening tonight. You could talk about restaurants that opened two days ago. All these kind of all these kind of things are available now, if you like. You could even insert the. If it doesn't sound perfect, you could insert the. Uh, generated part with a robot voice, if you like, just to bring it up to date. So I think companies just need to get used to moving quicker and abandoning this old technology because too too many of them and they're, they're fighting GPT, they're fighting the technology, and you can just tell it's because they haven't they've been kind of overtaken and they will continue to be overtaken by new companies if they don't move. Last thing I'll just talk about is travel applications. Um, I said this a while ago, I think flight, I don't think is going to be disrupted. Flight needs critical data, information, facts. We like the matrixes, we like to be able to compare um, lots of things, flight times and landing times and, and flight um, uh, stopover stops, that kind of thing. I don't think generative AI has a big space there now. Hotel, a little bit the same. Hotel's not that broken, searching for a list of hotels. Um, Airbnb is not that different to, you know, Expedia and Booking. Um, I think searching for those hotels is is where that could that could come in, using voice search to just search complex, make co complex filters, which currently you have to do those filters one at a time. I think experiences, tours, and activities is where we're going to see major disruption because we're closer to the ground, we're closer to all that information that these large language models have all that data on Golden Gate Bridge, top things to do in the city, places we should go. There's just a lot more information required and a lot more useful in real time to visitors. So I think that's where we're going to have the biggest impact. The difficult thing with all of this is you can generate itineraries, and a lot of companies have that generated itinerary builders all day. They're mostly just same thing you could do on OpenAI today. Um, the hard thing is connecting those to transactional pieces. So, like I say, this large language model knows everything about the Golden Gate Bridge, but it doesn't know what the Golden Gate Bridge is. 
it can give you a lat in the lung, so you can find it approximately, but that might not be correct. Golden Gate Bridge is lots of lats along so the north side, the south side, underneath, on top, there's lots of different parts of the bridge. So attaching this itinerary content, this generated content, to actual bookable things, like a ticket to the Golden Gate Bridge, which isn't a thing, but a ticket to the Empire State Building is, or entrance to a restaurant is a thing, getting those two attached together is actually quite difficult. And that's where these layers are going to fit in. I see companies doing that now. I think we're going to see lots of them. That's where this travel assistant comes in, which Expedia and Booking should do, but they won't. So the startup's going to come in and, and build that for them. So that's a really exciting space. It is quite difficult, even with this technology. But this technology enables just so much. And it's going to be some text. It's going to be lots of voice. And it's going to be lots of um, audio and video, probably back. Uh, you know, just ask a question and it's probably going to send a video back with maybe POI videos or somebody speaking back with all the information we want. And then click to list view, click to map view, all that good stuff. Just some ideas for now. When GBT4 comes out, I'll probably do another video with the latest on that. That's all for now. Thanks for listening.